Uh, still good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, that was a wonderful start. Um, by the way, um, I'm the deputy head of biomedical engineering. This is my first official external duty as the deputy head. Uh, thank you for the trust from the department and the dean's office. Uh, this wonderful event made me think, uh, sort of remind me what I did in 2000, in 2015. Um, so many thanks to the dean's office. Uh, it's really wonderful to celebrate the accomplishments of our associate uh, professors. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Joseph Rospoli. Um, he joined Purdue BME in 2015 after getting a PhD degree from uh, biomedical engineering at the Texas A&M University. Uh, but his footsteps have been everywhere um, in continental U.S. and elsewhere. And I'm sure he's going to talk about his excitements throughout his, uh, his, his growth. Um, he's got some really good research collaborations with top-notch medical schools, in including the University of Texas uh, Southwestern Medical School, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, IU School of Medicine, and the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And also, he's got really, really good collaboration with GE Healthcare. As you know, this is really hard for a assistant associate professor. So what he has been doing, um, he's focused on electromagnetic modeling and radio frequency coil design for MRI, for magnetic renaissance uh, imaging. Um, so you see these uh, uh, capital equipment in many hospitals, and he's really improving uh, the coil design of those machines, so really big deal. Um, he's designed over 30 coils for 3T and 7T MRI. And um, he has got a lot of awards at Purdue, um, including uh, the Impact Faculty Fellow. This is for undergraduate course transformation. So Joseph has been really, really a front runner in the department on undergraduate education. Um, he's also got uh, teaching awards, Willis A. Tucker, Prize for Outstanding Teaching in Biomedical Engineering and Mentoring. Um, so basically, he has been really a front runner in terms of undergraduate teaching, graduate uh, mentoring. Um, so uh, without further ado, and let me just present to you Dr. Joseph Raspoli. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand. I appreciate it. Um, honored to be your first uh, official uh, engagement uh, as our, uh, our interim head. Uh, also, I want to thank the college for putting on this series. It's been many years that it's been doing so, and uh, the tenure track is a, a grueling, uh, long experience. Uh, it could be uh, a marathon, just like a PhD program with ups and downs, and it's wonderful to celebrate successes uh, and to share uh, perhaps some lessons learned along the way for, for our colleagues. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, ten minutes is, is not a very long time uh, to go through. Uh, you know what I'd love to, to share with you? Uh, I could do a few power hours easily, uh, but I think that's you know, what draw people like me to the profession, uh, standing in front of a captive audience. Uh, so I'll just start with uh, some of my background. Uh, the places I've lived uh, could be seen on this part of the globe. Uh, when I was young, I moved around several locations on the, the East Coast, the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, my father was in the Navy, uh, so every two or three years we packed up and moved somewhere new. Uh, usually it was uh, somewhere in, in Virginia or Maryland. Uh, there were highlights there. Um, actually lived on Camp David uh, from 1983 to 85 uh, during the Reagan presidency and, uh, of course, uh, many military bases. Uh, but the formative years, I'd say, started when I was 10 and my father was assigned to Pearl Harbor. And I was lucky enough that after that assignment, he retired and, and found a civilian job out there. So uh, much of my upbringing was in Hawaii. If you've been out to Oahu, uh, Hanama Bay is a popular snorkeling spot on the east side of the island. And near Coco Head, our house was uh, maybe a couple of miles from there. It was just idyllic, beautiful uh, society, multicultural, just loved everything about it. But very expensive to live. And uh, you know, when the time came to graduate, I ended up leaving. But meanwhile, while I was there, 
uh, I was very interested in computers. Uh, I was building computers for family and friends. At the time, it was buying different components and motherboards and putting it all together. Uh, I was writing code in Pascal and writing early web pages uh, just in raw HTML for, for uh, companies as well as uh, personal interests, and I was the webmaster at our, our high school. So I knew I wanted to do something to do with computers, but I was also fascinated by electrical engineering in general. So I chose to go to the University of Virginia, since I had lived in Virginia before, and I, I was able to get in-state tuition in my third and fourth years because of that history there. Uh, I double majored in electrical engineering and computer engineering. They were separate programs at the time. And uh, ended up writing two undergraduate theses, uh, one for engineering and one for a minor in Chinese history. Um, so at a time, I was uh, one of the few people that, that could speak uh, at length about the, the policing of the British uh, administration in Shanghai in the latter 19th century. Uh, it was quite an interesting topic uh, on the side of my engineering courses. Uh, but uh, upon graduation, I never honestly gave you know, much thought about graduate school. Um, I'd worked with talented TAs, but I really was interested in getting a job, uh, making some money, um, getting out of debt, et cetera. And there were a number of companies that recruited around there. I had offers from defense contractors in the DC area, but I somewhat wanted to move west and I was intrigued by a job offer at Dell Computers in Austin, Texas. Um, so I ended up moving there. I lived in Austin area for eight years. It was a, a wonderful place to be in your 20s. Um, Austin's always changing. Supposedly, you know you're from Austin if you can complain about how great Austin used to be. Um, but uh, it's, it's still a wonderful city. And I ended up meeting uh, the young woman who would become my wife there. She was attending uh, University of Texas at Austin to get a master's degree in special education. And then she became a school teacher at the local public schools. And so uh, we were married. Uh, she decided a couple years later that she wanted to get a PhD. And she went back to UT Austin, got a PhD, and got her first academic position at Texas A&M University. And so I was still working for Dell, and she was starting at Texas A&M. And she'd come home from work and talk about you know, all the wonderful time she had mentoring students that day, teaching courses, doing research. And I was driving into my job, and, and I had great colleagues there, and it, and it paid well, and it was, there was a defined career path. But I realized uh, I had an early midlife crisis that I'm, I'm thankful I did have, um, because I realized I wasn't going to have personal fulfillment um, you know, staying in an in industry job similar to Dell or the other companies in the Austin area. So now that she was a, an assistant professor, I decided to quit and go to graduate school myself. And it, made plenty of sense to do so at Texas A&M University and College Station. I wanted to build on my electrical engineering background, but pivot maybe to something that had to do with medicine. I really wanted to help people more immediately. Uh, you could say at Dell that you know, you're building these data center servers and they're going out and doing wonderful things for all sorts of applications, but I really wanted that more immediate impact, perhaps even working in a hospital setting uh, as part of my career. So I found a lab there that was mainly electrical engineering oriented and you know, ended up getting into hardware design for MRI, as, as Nan said, radio frequency coil design, and ended up then coming to Purdue. But what brought me to Purdue, obviously, tremendous uh, international reputation for excellence. Uh, the other opportunities I had uh, were you know, the caliber of, of engineering students and peers in the faculty that I would have uh, didn't compare. Um, so I was very excited about Purdue in that regard. Um, there was a, an alumnus that I also admired uh, nearly 100 years ago, uh, Edward Mills Purcell, who got a double E degree in 1933 and would go on to uh, win the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the NMR phenomenon, which led to MRI. And I really appreciated his, his philosophical uh, view of research uh, in his Nobel uh, speech talking about at his doorstep, great heaps of, of protons quietly processing in the Earth's magnetic field uh, in the snow. And, and I really connected with that. Um, and I'd remembered that um, from before I was introduced to Purdue in Indiana. But at the time, it was preeminent teams that were carrying out most of the hiring here. And for me, it was the Engineering Healthier Brains preeminent team that drew me to Purdue. Uh, whereas I could tell you all about the literature in MR hardware, electromagnetic modeling, uh, I was more familiar with the Engineering Healthier Brains initiative uh, through watching Frontline um, and Professor Tom Talavich, who led that team uh, back in 2011, first uh, you know, 
discussed uh, the dangers of repetitive head impacts through uh, collision sports. And so I was honored to join that team and work with all the colleagues, uh, Eric Nauman and others in that preeminent team. But I have to be honest, Purdue also you know, is exceptional in their partner placement program. Um, my wife not even being in the College of Engineering, uh, it's not common to have a, a program that the provost does a wonderful job here at really facilitating uh, partner placements across uh, colleges. And uh, that also played into our decision. Um, Purdue was in the midst of uh, doubling down and investing in MRI hardware and, and resources here on campus. About a year after I came, uh, Purdue opened the MRI facility uh, with a three Tesla human scanner from GE Healthcare uh, that I'm now the director of. Uh, and there's a photo of my group at the time uh, at the opening ceremony of the facility. So very exciting time to come here. I continued my work with uh, Professor Tlavich and the Neurotrauma Group. Uh, my little area that I carved out was doing MR spectroscopy on collision sports athletes. So uh, gauging the concentration of different metabolites in the brain in longitudinal studies uh, before football season, during, and after recovery. And also diffusion tensor imaging, where we looked at white matter integrity uh, throughout the same time course um, with a nice little graphic here of, of one of our participants, uh, white matter uh, in 3D. Um, I also stuck with what I considered my more bread and butter, which was the radio frequency coil design and electromagnetic modeling. Um, for that, it was for ultra high field magnetic resonance. So I worked with different partners, as, uh, as Non mentioned, uh, including uh, the University of Pittsburgh. We had uh, NIH support uh, for these studies where, um, succinctly to say, uh, high field MRI, you can no longer have a single coil that transmits and excites protons in the body. Uh, the shorter wavelength requires that you have more than one. In this case, we have 16 independent coils, or you could think of them as antennas for magnetic fields. And they're all operating independently. And ideally, you have a nice uniform magnetic field that's created. Um, but in the not ideal case, you know, MRI could act a bit like a microwave and heat up tissue. Um, so really, this is all research only, uh, seven Tesla MRI, and that's because the safety aspects of it have not been hammered out enough. And that's where a large part of my research lies in performing electromagnetic modeling to ensure safety with parallel transmit hardware. And we've also spent a good time um, on breast MRI as well, because that's something I've carried through uh, since my uh, early days as a doctoral student. Um, and then here, taking advantage of our three Tesla scanners, we've developed a class of wearable coils. Um, the initial motivation indeed was for breast MRI. So to be able to have a wearable array of coils that can provide better image quality for a woman getting a breast MRI, which is normally done prone uh, with uh, a very fairly uncomfortable um, position. Um, but my, my hope was if we could do this supine, wearing uh, either a stretchable array similar to what you see at the bottom right. Um, and these are easily manufactured with conductive thread and embroidery machines. So I partnered with GE Healthcare to evaluate some of these coils, including this 60-channel array uh, that's now with their partner at Stanford uh, Surgery and Radiology for evaluation. So very excited to continue this work, and this has brought me um, one of my patent uh, applications here at Purdue as well. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on service opportunities, and, and that's beyond you know, serving in committees here. Um, one service opportunity that I jumped on, and I'm very glad I did, was an international uh, working group um, through my primary organization, the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine. And this was a three-year effort that culminated in a 120-page white paper uh, with experts around the globe. So uh, I, was, I was chairing the RF safety subsection, which was the largest chapter of this white paper. And it was really a great opportunity to uh, make colleagues uh, and friends around the globe. Also, though, to manage a group of different um, colleagues who sometimes are competing in the research realm. Um, so that um, definitely uh, has helped uh, my future uh, collaborative opportunities and uh, international reputation. Um, but finally, it all comes back to the students. There are countless faculty, peers, and mentors here, um, too many to list really, but uh, as well as undergraduate students in my lab, I think about 30 so far. But the graduate alumni from my group have gone on to very prestigious postdocs. Um, I'm very proud of them all. And I wouldn't be here without uh, these graduates. And I also have a, a wonderful uh, current cohort of students uh, across BME and electrical engineering uh, that I continue to work with. And it's really, that's why we're here um, for our students. And uh, it's just one of the highlights of the job, in my opinion, to be able to mentor them and watch them grow. So I think I'm already over my 10 minutes, uh, as quick as that seemed.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, questions? Uh, I think we can allow two quick questions. Uh, Joseph, I do have a question. Um, I was reading your, your biography and different people you work with. So what lessons did you learn from your experience uh, chairing the uh, RF Safety Working Group? That, uh, that's a great question, Mon. Uh, that working group, uh, you know, they're experts from France, Germany, England, Korea. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, some of them might be competing for grants. Some of them ha might have alternate approaches to how they feel experimental hardware should be validated or even designed uh, for high-field high MRI. So when I was given that opportunity, I, I talked with some uh, more senior colleagues who have been in these types of uh, uh, working groups before for advice. And one, one that really came through and was relevant here was to not let everything boil down to the least common denominator uh, where everyone is in agreement. Um, otherwise, you end up putting a white paper out that really has no meaning um, and uh, would be not quite as impactful. So, there were many difficult conversations in the meetings we had over the years, and you know we have to we had to come to consensus through voting. It wasn't always unanimous, um, and but we also wanted to be inclusive um, to include all the different approaches, uh, but really to to make sure that we uh, didn't let things kind of go down to the least common denominator. Well, quick question, anybody? Okay, well, let's give another round of applause to Joseph. Thank you very much. Thank you.